Happy Wednesday, friends, and welcome back to Energy Express. It's me, your buddy, Joel. Today, we're gonna start our day looking at some butterflies. A little fact for you. Did you know that there are 130 species of butterflies in West Virginia alone? Our friend Carlos is gonna tell us all about the monarch butterfly. Let's go visit Carlos and learn more. My name is Carlos Quesada. I am an Extension Assistant Professor at West Virginia University. And today I will talk about monarchs, butterflies, and their migration. So monarchs, butterflies are insects, but let's start a little more simple than that. What are insects? Insects are the only animals that have three pairs of legs and their body is divided in three, head, thorax, and abdomen. So there are thousands of thousands different of insect species, and for that reason, they are uh, divided on big groups that are called orders. So I happen to have a small collection right here, and we can see several, several groups. So for example, we can see two bugs over here. Those are within the order Hemiptera. Then we have uh, beetles right here. Those are within the order Coleoptera. We have wasps and, we, and bees. Those are within the order Hymenoptera. And then we have moth and butterflies. And those are on, in that order uh, Lepidoptera. So monarchs happen to be on that order. And this, this happened to be a monarch butterfly right here. So anyway, there are about 750 species of butterflies in the United States, and around 130 of those species are here in West uh, Virginia. So all species of monarchs have a complete metamorphosis. What do that mean? That means that they uh, have four different life stages egg, larva, pupae, and adults. So I happen to have a model over here of, uh, of monarchs. So if you see uh, these uh, leaves have a little eggs over there. These eggs will hatch and will uh, produce this very tiny larva, which for Lepidopteras are also known as caterpillars. So as they eat, they grow, and they go as big as a two to three inches. So one, once they are this big, uh, this, uh, this, this larva will tie their abdomen to a place where they feel safe, and sometimes this place can be branches or twigs. So when they tie, they will start transforming into these pupae that in this case is called a uh, crocillus. So these uh, pupae in this stage, they don't move much, they don't eat, but inside over there, there are a lot of transformations every day. They are, they are making a lot of transformation until an adult came from uh, the, uh, from the pupae. So the adults of uh, monarchs will have wings. Um, they will have this beautiful or orange color with black and white dots. They will also have a pair of, a pair of antenna and three pairs of legs. But why are we talking about monarch butterflies today? Well, monarchs butterflies are the only butterflies in the world that completes a round trip, just like birds. But what makes this actually more remarkable is that none of these monarchs have done this trip before, and none of these monarchs will actually survive this, this trip. So let's talk a little more about uh, this trip. I happen to have a map of the United States over here. Well, United States in the middle, Canada north, and then Mexico south. So if you can see this little point in the middle of Mexico, 
that's where monarch, monarchs uh, overwinter. So this is a beautiful mountains, uh, high altitudes, uh, high uh, humidity, and the weather is warm. So while we are here in West Virginia supporting the snow, they are basically in vacation in Mexico. So anyway, sometime in spring, monarchs will know that it's spring and they will start flying north. So they will, uh, they will fly and also they will eat, they will mate, and then they will lay eggs. And that generation will die about some place in uh, uh, the south of Texas. However, the eggs that that, that that generation produce will then produce, as you remember, larva, pupae, and also adults. Those adults of that new generation will also start flying north. And then it takes about four to five generations to fly from the middle of Mexico to the northeast of the United States, including West Virginia. So uh, something that uh, you should know also is that adults of monarchs butterflies live for about uh, two to six weeks. Then in the summer, uh, monarchs will be everywhere United States, including West Virginia, and then they will have their life cycle as I explained it before. But sometime, sometime in September, because of the short length light of date and the cooler temperature, monarchs will start signaling that they need to go south again. So the adults will produce a special eggs. This new generation from this special eggs are called super generation monarchs. And these super generation individuals are different from their parents in several ways. One of them is that they are bigger and they are stronger. Another one is that only that generation is so strong that they fly south to Mexico in one single generation. So if you see the map, they fly from West Virginia to the middle of Mexico in one single generation. This super generation will fly south and every day they will feed and they will fly. And the next day they will feed and fly for about two months. It will take two months to go from West Virginia to the middle of Mexico. If you think about it, this is 2,500 miles that one or several butterflies will make this journey. So how do they know they're going south? Well, these uh, monarch butterflies use a compass and the time of, that, of, of, of the day, yes. They know what time it is. So they use their antenna to know what the time of the day that it is, and then a compass on, you, on their mind to uh, know where it's south. And the way that they basically do it is, if you're going south, and then it's in the morning, the sun will be on your left. And if it is in the afternoon, the sun will be on your right. And that is, that is uh, how they do it. And you may be questioning, like, how do they know? Well, there are some scientific uh, experiments where they type butterflies to uh, some machines and they uh, put uh, in different directions and they move the butterflies and the butterfly always like to fly south. And that's how, uh, how they know. So here uh, we have a model of a plant. Monarchs feed on milkweeds 
and they therefore the adults will lay their eggs on the milkweed uh, leaves so right here you can see uh, a little eggs those eggs will hatch and will produce small caterpillars that looks just like this one right here but very small those will feed and grow as they, they eat and until they uh, have a size of about two to three inches. Then those uh, larvae or caterpillars will uh, tie themselves from their abdomen to a branch and they will form this uh, pupae. So the pupae uh, will have will have a lot of transformation inside of them and uh, for butterfly uh, for monarchs this is called a uh, chrysalis so anyway once a lot of transformations happen uh, adults will uh, emerge from this pupae and an adult will be just uh, like this one over here uh, with um, wings uh, a pair of antenna, three pair of uh, legs. Today we talk about monarchs biology a little bit and also their migration and I hope you learned something. Thank you. Okay, next up we're going to the pollinator patch. Did you know that a bat is a pollinator? Our friend Brandy has all the details on the pollinator pros. Let's head over to Brandy and learn more about pollinators. Hi, I'm Brandy Bradham. I serve as the Extension Agent for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Roan County. I'm going to talk a little bit about attracting pollinators to your garden. There's lots of ways to attract pollinators and the reason that we want to do this is because anything you're going to put in your mouth food-wise, you are getting as a result of good pollination. Um, from the cucumbers to the melons that you have, there's always going to be something that has been affected by pollination. And some good ways to create a great pollinator habitat is to make sure that there's a variety of landscape in your yard. You want to make sure there's ground cover, there's different heights, there's some overgrowed areas, there's also some water sources, even some bare ground are essential to making sure pollinators are uh, abundant in the landscape. So we want to make sure that you have a bounty of different colors. As you know, um, when we talk about pollinators, we're talking about bees, beetles, uh, butterflies, um, hummingbirds, ty different types of birds, and even bats can be considered pollinators. So we want to make sure that we provide a little bit of everything for all those pollinators. So mix it up that's the first tip i'm going to give you just make sure you mix up what they have as food sources so when you're talking about food source you want to have nectar which is that sweet sweet stuff they need um, for activity and you also want to have the pollen that gets to um, that they help spread to other uh, plants in your landscape so of course bees are attracted to more purples and yellows while butterflies like reds and purples and hummingbirds prefer reds and purples so we want to make sure there's a variety of shapes in the flowers so we want open flowers we want tubular flowers um, rounded flowers so think about all these things but one important thing is, is if you're actually planting plants or flowers to add to your pollinator selection you want to plant in clusters pollinators like to go to places where they can get a lot of nectar or pollen in one area so you want to plant in at least three to fives. Um, that's a good rule of thumb if you're planting plants to attract pollinators. Uh, the next thing you want to make sure you do is provide a water source. Water is very important if it's just a bird bath or um, a little stream that's next to your pollination area. It's a good idea to have water for those pollinators close by. The other important thing about um, keeping pollinators safe and healthy is providing shelter whether it's rocks or that overgrown brush at the edge of the yard that may not look tidy in the, in the well-groomed landscape, but if you're 
goal is attracting pollinators, you want to make sure that you have some of that as well as bare ground because um, solitary bees prefer to nest underground and a lot of beetles and so forth will go into that bare soil. So we want to make sure we have rocks, we have that overgrown um, grasses and then ground cover. So we have shelter for those pollinators to hide in. Another good tip in the in your landscape is to provide a variety of trees. If you think of like dogwoods and tulip poplars and maple trees even, their bloom are a significant source for honeybees, for example, and they also give a, a um, variety of food source. When you think about food source and variety, you wanna make sure that that is at all, all throughout the season. So if you're planting specifically for pollinators, you wanna make sure that you plant in succession or if you think about what times of year things come to bloom. So if you've got some perennials, when do they come to bloom? What can you plant next to continually have a food source throughout the growing season? The next tip I'll give you is to make sure to include some native species of plants. For example, we all know that butterflies love um, joe pie weed or otherwise milkweed is another good source. So having those native plants, uh, there's a list that you can find by contacting your local extension office to get those native plants if you're not familiar with them. I would highly recommend that. Um, and here's just another tip if you're a gardener who likes to eat um, from your garden and not just look at the blooms, you can use things like your herbs. Um, if you're using those for culinary purposes and you're done with picking the, the leaves or pinching the tops off to get the herbal supplements out of them, you can let those bloom and go to seed. That allows the pollinators to have another source of nectar and pollen. The last tip I want to remind you is that in pollinator gardens, we don't want to use pesticides. If we are having to use pesticides to get rid of certain um, diseases or insect problems, we want to make sure we're doing it at the time of day where pollinators are least active. Of course, bees do not come out in late evening and that would allow time for any low risk pesticides. So we want to make sure we choose first the least toxic um, pesticide that you can to treat the problem. And then second, we want to make sure that that pesticide that you are applying to your garden is applied late in the evening where there's no wind and little chance of damaging the pollinators in the area. I hope this will encourage you to provide a diverse landscape to attract pollinators. Just remember that they have to have lots of different colors, lots of different shapes, and that will make sure that you hear the buzz and the hum of all those pollinators throughout the season. Okay, friends. Earlier in the week, you heard from our friend, Mike Book, who read us some stories that were a little bit spooky. Now we're gonna head to the campfire and we're gonna pack our s'mores and all of our snacks as Mike regales us with another one of his favorite stories. Take it away, Mike. Hi, and welcome to Appalachian Tales. We're here today with some of our friends from Energy Express, and we're going to do a story for you. I'm Mike Book. I'm the director for Harrison County Parks and Recreation, and also I've been a 25-year contact for Energy Express. So it's a program that we love, and uh, we're going to have some fun with things. We only had to bribe the kids once. We promised they, they could have s'mores if we had them watch our uh, story here. This story is a favorite. I've done it almost every year. And actually, I heard it first when I was your all's age. And this is called Taily Poe. So we'll do that and let, let you listen to it as we go. Find the right pages here. And here we are in our setting. A long time ago, an old man lived by himself in the deep, big woods. I mean, he was by himself. There's no houses next door. You know, he didn't even see a mile away to find a neighbor. His cabin had only one room, and that room was his living room, his bedroom, his dining room, and his kitchen too. And that's his cabin in the woods. Old man had three dogs. They were Israeli buddies. They, one was called Uno, one was called Inno, and one was called Capco Calico. <laughs> and that was their names. One day the man decided to go hunting. 
to catch something for his supper. He goes, here, 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 boys, let's go. He shouted for his dogs and they came bounding out of the porch, eager for the hunt. So there they go off into the woods. Of course, he had to hunt and catch a lot of his food. After many hours of hunting, the wind began to blow hard and from the valley and it'll be dark soon. Have you guys ever been in the woods at dark? You start hearing that wind's howling. Like oh, camping. it could be scary. I like camping. I live in the country. Uh, but all we've caught was one skinny rabbit. He, he said, oh boys, it's gonna have to do. We're gonna head home. Well, the old man cooked, ate the rabbit and gave the bones to the dogs. Then he leaned back in his chair, all comfy like by the fire, and watched the moon as it rose up on the hill. The wind whistled around the cabin. Just as the old man was about to doze off, a most curious creature crept through a, between the crack in the wall and the logs. It had a big, long, furry tail. Well, as soon as the old man saw that varmint, he reached for his hatchet right by the fireplace. And with one sweet whack, he whacked that tail off. The creature slipped out through another crack and ran away. Well, that old man was still hungry, so he cooked and ate the tail. After that, he sure went and stuffed up all those holes that he could find. He didn't want that varmint getting back in at him. And he went to bed. Well, his stomach was full and he fell asleep. He was in a nice, warm and snug in his bed. And before he knew it, he was fast asleep. Let's see. Old man hadn't been asleep very long when he woke up. Something was climbing on the walls of his cabin. All he sounded was a scratch, scratch, scratch up the side. He's, he tried to tell himself it was a cat or something. You know, he wanted to convince himself. Who's that? The old man said, he lay still and listened, and after a while, he heard a voice say, Taily po, taily po, all I want is my taily po. I think I'd hide underneath those covers. That scratch, scratch went on and on, and the old man began to shiver and shake. Oh, then he remembered his dogs. He went to the door and called out, here boys, here boys. The dogs came piling out from under the porch and with their noses to the ground, they chased whatever that varmint was off into the big deep woods. Well, that old man, he got back a bit, pulled those covers real tight around his neck now and went back to sleep. In the middle of the night, he woke up again. Now he heard something trying to get in the door of his cabin. Who's that? He yelled. And what do you want this time of night when all good folks should be in bed? He listened and all he could hear again was that scratch, scratch, scratch on the door this time. Then that voice rang out. Taily po, taily po. I'm coming to get my taily po. Hmm, I don't know. Old man was so, he, he couldn't stand up. He was so scared his knees was a shaking and wobbling. He called out for his dogs, they were under the bed. Uno, Uno, Capico Calico, here boys, here. And those dogs come burring out and burst through the corner of the cabin and right out and they caught up with whatever that thing was at the gate. Went through the gate, knocked it down and they chased it into the swamp. At last all was quiet again. With a weary sigh, the man went back to sleep. Well, they're going to chase it off in the woods. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Toward morning, something down in the swamp woke the old man up. First, he thought it was the wind blowing louder than usual. But when he listened again, he heard that voice. You know and I know all I want is my taily po. What is a taily po? Oh, no. You're going to think about that and watch. Old man called his dogs. Here, boys, here. Uno, Uno, come, come, Calico. Here, boys. This time the dogs didn't come. The old man ran outside again and called, Here, boys. Calico, Uno, Uno. Nobody came. The dogs didn't come. Whatever that thing was had left those dogs out in the swamp and got those dogs lost. I think I know what it is. But there was no trace anywhere. 
It's just the sound of the wind blowing around that torn down fence. And the thing that led the dogs in the swamp, you didn't hear them right now, but they were lost. Sadly, the man went back into his cabin and shut up and barred the doors and put furniture in front of it, whatever he could, and went back to bed. I know what it is. Well, let's see here. Just before daylight, the old man opened his eyes. You know, have you ever just sort of woke up and your eyes popped open? You know, when you're thinking about things. So that's what happened to him. And those opened up and he heard something was stirring in the pots and pans under the sink. Sounded like, he, he said, it must be a cat. And it said it started climbing at the foot of his bed. And he heard that scratch, scratch, scratch on the side of his bed. He looked over the foot of his bed and he saw two pointy ears sticking up above it. Then he saw two big, round, fiery eyes looking at him. The man wanted to call, for, he wanted to call for help, but he couldn't get a word, his, he was just stuffed up, his throat wouldn't work. He couldn't get a sound out, he was so scared. That thing kept creeping up until it was right next to the old man and, and pulling on those covers and creeping up, creeping up. And he said in a low voice right in that man's ear, you know and I know that I'm here to get my Taily Poe. The man sat up, pulled the covers over his head. Uh, he got his voice back suddenly. I haven't got your Taily Poe, I haven't got it. Yes, you have, said the voice. Yes, you have. And then it jumped on top of him and just tore all the blankets and everything to shreds. Everything was in pieces. Now, I've got to tell you, there's nothing left of that cabin in the woods. The only thing there is a chimney standing. No sign of the furniture, the law, no sign of the man. They have no idea, but you know what? The neighbors who live down the road say that every night in the valley when the moon shines and the winds blow, you hear a voice in the wind saying, Taily po, Taily po, now I've got my Taily po. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great summer. Uh, have a lot of fun with the kids and uh, we'll see you soon. Ah, friends, that about wraps it up for today. Parting is such sweet sorrow. But don't be too sad. We'll be back tomorrow for another exciting day of Energy Express. We'll see you tomorrow!